I have the $5 million PPP loan fraud case where my client made up information to obtain about $5.1 million in PPP loans. So he made up all of the numbers in the applications for the loans. He created companies that weren't real. He said he had employees that he didn't have and he obtained several different loans. What he did with the money was he put some of it into his bank accounts. He invested some of it into investment accounts and then he purchased three separate properties as investments. His intention was always to return the money. He just wanted to make some money off of it and then he was going to pay it back. Unfortunately, the feds came knocking at his door and arrested him before he was able to do that. So we have sentencing coming up in a couple of weeks and I argued in my sentencing memorandum, which is, these are my arguments that I present to the judge two weeks before sentencing. So the judge understands what our arguments are and why we're asking for a reduced sentence. And I argued several factors, one of which is that my client is going to be deported to a country very far away. He has a son in California who is four years old and he will probably very likely not see him much for the rest of his life, whether or not the, the child's mother decides to bring him to that country to see him is up to her. And so it's a very, very sad story for him and his son. Another issue that we are arguing is the fact that the government has been able to obtain or recover all of the funds. They have recovered all of the bank accounts and the investment accounts. I was tasked with hiring a realtor to sell the properties. So one of the properties has been sold, it's in escrow. The other two properties are a little trickier and so they're gonna take a little longer to sell. But the government has a list pendants, which is a property lien on these properties. And with respect to the one that's already sold, that's in escrow, the money goes straight to the government. The same will happen because the realtors that I found for my client, because he's in custody, are working directly with the financial unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So they're being directed, they're being sent paperwork, and so everything is going directly back to the government after the realtors get their realtor fees and the costs are covered for the cost of escrow and whatever else. So the government actually already has about $4 million and then plus this property that sold for 950,000. The other two properties are probably going to sell for over 1.5 million. So the government is getting all of their money back. So that's my second argument. My third argument is that my client does have some medical issues and that it would not be wise to keep him in custody for long. The fourth argument actually that goes along with the fact that he's being deported means that even if he were to do the residential drug treatment program, he would not be eligible to get a year off of his sentence. He is also not eligible for the halfway house and he will be spending at least 45 days in immigration custody after he's released from the Bureau of Prisons before he is sent back to his country. So that is at least almost two years, more time than he would do than somebody who wasn't being deported. The other issue, aside from his medical issues, is the fact that at the time that he engaged in the conduct, he was suffering from a mental breakdown. And we do have medical records to support that argument. So what's really frustrating is that when you look at the federal sentencing guidelines, and this is the guidelines chart, his, the low end of his sentencing range is about 57 months. He has no criminal history category. He's in category 25. So it's 57 to 71 months. The U.S. attorney in his sentencing memo has argued that because of those mitigating factors, which he acknowledged even before I argued them, that he's being deported, that they've obtained the money back, and that he was having a mental breakdown at the time that he engaged in the conduct, the U.S. attorney says that that supports a low-end sentence. And that is so infuriating because the sentencing guidelines do not take into account mitigating factors to a tiny, tiny extent that they do. But the difference between a low-end sentence and a downward variance from the sentencing guidelines are these mitigating facts. And this is what we agree, they're what we call the 3553A factors, and this is the nature and circumstance of the offense. In this case, my client was having a breakdown when he engaged in the offense, and they're getting all their money back, and then the history and characteristics of the defendant. 
also include the fact that he's being deported, that he has a four-year-old son that he's probably going to see just a few times in his lifetime, maybe once a year if he's really lucky, and that he has these other physical issues. The guidelines don't take these things into consideration. These are the 3553A factors that the judge has to consider at sentencing. So we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, we have a very tough judge in Los Angeles, California, and I don't know what he's gonna do with these factors. The other really, really frustrating fact is that just because the government has seized and my client has forfeited all of this money and these properties does not mean that it is going to go directly to restitution. The banks will then have to petition the U.S. Attorney's Office in order to get their money back. And until that is done, which is a process that could take God knows how long, six months to a year, my client's record at the prison is going to say that he still owes $5 million in restitution. So they will still be taking money off his books, hopefully only $25 a quarter, but still when you're you know, needing to live off of the commissary and you need every penny that you can get just to buy soap and shampoo and reasonable food, it's frustrating even if $25 is taken off of your books. So we have sentencing on the 26th. I will know then what the judge is recommending or sentencing my client to. So as I said, the government is asking for 57 months. Probation acknowledged some of the mitigating factors and recommended 48 months, which is actually one and a half levels below the sentencing guideline range. And I'm asking for a sentence of 37 months, which is four levels below the sentencing guideline range, which I think is reasonable in this case. But it is a $5 million case, and it depends on whether this particular judge has a really strong feeling about these COVID relief funds. The last judge I was in front of at sentencing on a $1.5 million PPP loan fraud case was very upset about the fact that this was one of the most difficult times in our recent history and that the abuse of these funds was very serious. We will see. People do things when they're desperate, and this client was desperate. He was not thinking clearly, and he made a stupid mistake. And hopefully he won't have to spend too much time in federal prison as a result of his mistake.